quick time out of your day. Just wanted to, you know, give you guys a quick update about what Agora does. Uh, quick show of hands. Has anyone heard of Agora before? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, when I ask this question at the end, everyone should be raising their hand. Cool. So Agora is a real time communication platform. Uh, you know, we are the largest one in the world, uh, serving over 20 billion minutes per month. Uh, you know, we have 200 data centers across the world. Uh, it, you know, installed on two billion devices worldwide. So probably within one of the apps you guys have, so you want to install it, the Agora SDK lies there. If you're probably using any live streaming of sorts or video chat of sorts, it's, you know, likely that it could be in your. Um, so what makes us different? There's so many players in this space. Well, you know, standard WebRTC, whatever it is, you know, you name it. Uh, what we've done is we've built a proprietary network layer of over 200 data centers, and we have an uh, algorithm that routes it from uh, data center to data center within a matter of milliseconds. What does that actually mean for your experience? It means globally you have a uh, latency of around 200 milliseconds. To the eye, 50 milliseconds is detectable, 200 milliseconds, and we're getting that number down and down. Uh, some of the you know basic use cases that we see uh, is one to one chat, one to one or one to many video chat as well as well as uh, many to many in, in team game play scenarios. Uh, some of the you know different uh, I guess products we also offer recording. Uh, we have a huge third party marketplace. So if you guys ever want to do a Snapchat like filter experience, video calling, that's all possible with you know a few clicks of a button and you can package that up. Spin the demo app the right way, and you know, integrate that directly into your application. You know, so the possibilities are endless. We give you a access to everything. You customize every single part of your, uh, you know, experience. We focus on delivering the video to you guys with good quality, and then you can build experiences with, you know, AR kit on top of it, reality kit on top of it, you name it, right? So. Um, image detection, whatever it is, and we have a lot of cool demos at our booth, so please do stop by, ask any questions, we're, we're here all three days to help out, and uh, you know, thank you guys for hearing me out, appreciate it. I'm Kaya Thomas. I work as a full-time iOS engineer at Calm, and previously I worked at Slack on the messaging team. And today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about my journey into tech and how I came to create an app called WeRead2. But before we get into how I got into tech, let's go way back. My first love was books. <laughs> Since I was very young, I've always been an avid reader. And I've been grateful to my parents because when I was growing up, they put a lot of effort into making sure that I had children's books and where I felt represented. They would go to specialty bookstores and find picture books that had black girl characters. But as I got older, I realized that a lot of the books that I was reading, that I was choosing on my own from the library or Barnes & Noble, the characters didn't represent me. And although I love these books, these are some of the most popular books uh, that I read when I was in middle school and high school. And I love these books and these series, but it started to affect my self-esteem. I started to think, why aren't the main characters in these books ever black girls? Does that mean that these authors don't care to write diverse characters? Am I invisible to these authors? And it really started to affect my relationship with books, which is unfortunate because I've always loved reading. In 2016, out of the 3,400 children's books published in the United States, only 22% were about people of color, and only 12% were written by people of color. 
I started to think, what if there was a resource where people could easily find books that had main characters of color and were written by authors of color? But I was in high school at the time and I had no idea what computer science was, how to create a resource like that, or how to go about making it possible. So fast forward to college. When I started college at Dartmouth, I thought that I was going to be an environmental engineering major. I went to my advisor to start planning out my schedule, and he pretty much mapped out all of these prerequisites and said, if you don't do this exact plan, there's no way you'll ever finish this engineering major or survive. And coming in, that was hugely intimidating. I started to think, maybe I'm not cut out for engineering. I had always loved science and math growing up, but having that advisor discourage me and tell me that I probably wouldn't be able to finish, it made me rethink. Maybe I should do humanities. Maybe I'm not cut out to actually succeed in an engineering major in college. Luckily, during my winter break, after my first term at college, I came across a TED Talk by Kimberly Bryant, the founder of Black Girls Code. She gave this talk in 2013, and I highly recommend checking it out. But it was hugely inspiring to me to hear her talk about how women of color should study computer science and be exposed to computer science at a young age. I had no idea what computer science was, but when she said that by 2020, there will be 1.4 million computed related job openings, that was like an eye opener to me. And it may seem like a superficial reason to be initially interested in computer science, but in 2008, when the financial crash happened, my mom lost her job of 30 years as an executive assistant. So I saw what financial instability can cause in a family and the stress it causes, and I didn't want to have that in whatever career I chose. So seeing that there were so many job openings and we wouldn't even able, be able to fill all those jobs from the United States, it seemed like computer science was something that I should check out. So I Googled how to learn how to code, and I came across Code Academy. I did the Python course, and when I did my first Hello World, I was completely hooked. I knew that this was something that I wanted to do. So from then on, I was all in. I took my first computer science course that my second college, term in college, and it was a course called Programming Through Interactive Art. And it was funny because the actual introduction course to the major wasn't available that term. So I took the non-major introductory course. But the non-major introductory course actually ended up being more fun because we were using Java to create games, to create music, and I was so mesmerized with the ability to use code to create something that people could actually interact with. So I, I did as most people do. I looked up what, real, what, what makes a real programmer or developer. So I made a GitHub account. And I made a static web page from a GitHub I.O. account. And I put those Java applets that I did in class on that static page. Now, after I did that, I started to think, could I actually make this like a real job? Like, could I get a job on campus doing programming? I worked all throughout college, and in my first term, I started out working in a smoothie bar and a cafe in the library. And I wanted to actually think if I could use the skills that I had been learning to maybe further my career. So I looked on our job search in our college campus, and I came across a student programmer job for Tilt Factor, which was a game development lab. Tilt Factor makes games for social change, board games and web games. Now, when I applied for the job, I was really not thinking that I was going to get it. I only had one real full computer science course at the time, and I was in the middle of my second one. So I emailed the head of the lab, who was Mary Flanagan, and she's someone who's very known in the game design world. And I told her how much of a role model she was and how much I would love the opportunity to be able to interview for the student programmer position. So uh, she responded back and she said, okay, you can come interview with the lab manager. And I went over and interviewed with the map lab manager. I had my GitHub account ready. I had my web page with my Java applets. Now this web page was very bare. It was straight bare HTML <laughs> with just the Java applets thrown in, no CSS. And I, I told him, hey, I know I'm just a freshman. 
I know I don't have the experience, but I'm telling you, I have the potential and the ability to learn. And I showed him that I knew Virgin Control. I showed him the website. And he was really surprised because he told me that so far, all the people who had applied for the role were junior and senior computer science students, but none of them knew Git, none of them had a GitHub account, and none of them actually showed any initiative or interest in programming outside of the classroom. So I was the first person who actually had showed that initiative and the ability that I want to learn and really do this, this job. So I got the job and I worked there for about eight months. And it was my first time working kind of in a team environment doing programming. I learned version control, I learned a bit of back end. I got to really work on this cool game, which was tagging metadata for the Botanica library so that their records don't get destroyed in the future. And it was a game where the image pops up and the user just types in what they think it is. And then we use those guesses to tag metadata on the app. And so I was so excited to be able to actually create things that people were using. And I wanted to continue to do this. So I started thinking about internships. So as my first year was coming to a close, I knew I wanted to actually work as a programmer over the summer. Otherwise, I probably would have ended up working at my local mall or something. And I really wanted to do something that would further my career. So a family friend sent me a job listing from a mailing list they were a part of. And the senior vice president of mobile development at Time Inc said that she was looking for two interns to join her that summer. And when my family friend sent me this email, I said, there's no way I'm getting that job. I only had a couple of computer science courses, barely any experience, and there's no way a senior vice president is gonna want me to work under her. So I kind of forgot about it, and a couple of weeks went by, and no, nothing was really working out in terms of internships. So I said, okay, it can't hurt to apply. So I sent in my resume, and then I did a call with the hiring manager. And we had a great conversation about the things I had been doing in my courses, the things I had done in the game development lab. And she said, I think you know, your experience is great so far, and the next person you'll be talking to is Erin. I said, OK. And then I looked it up, and I realized that Erin was the senior vice president. <laughs> I didn't think that an intern would interview with the senior vice president. My idea of an internship was someone who, you know, gets coffee or is a lowly intern and really doesn't have much kind of pull in an organization. But I did have the conversation with Erin, and I told her about all the things that I had done. And particularly, I told her about this really cool game that I created, which was a spinoff of 2048. At that time, 2048 was super popular. I don't know if any of you have played it, but what I did is I created a women in tech version where instead of numbers, the blocks were pictures of women in tech, and they would go together, and each one would create a new woman in tech, and there would be a Java alert with a fact about what the woman in tech does. And so I showed her that game, and she was like, I'm playing it right now. <laughs> and it was just really cool for her to actually be using something I was working with while we were actually talking on the phone. And I was telling her about my experience, and she said, you know what, I loved our conversation. Can you do iOS development? And I said, no, but I can learn iOS development. <laughs> so um, luckily, I got the job. And she said, out of time, it's 100 and so ever brands. Um, you'll be working with Entertainment Weekly. And so I didn't know any iOS development, and I didn't have a mentor to actually teach me iOS development. So this is where the internet came really in handy. So I used like Wave Renderlich, AppCoda, and a bunch of free resources and tutorials to learn app, app development as I was doing my internship. And so this was the first app I created. It was a simple app that really pulled from a new API that Timing had created. At the time, this is when they were just starting up their product development and engineering organization, and they had created an API that allows you to pull any articles from any one of their brands. So the idea that Entertainment Weekly had is they wanted to create an app that allowed you to get all the articles from a particular TV show that you loved. And so this prototype was based off of the True Blood app, the True Blood show. And so it was really fun to be able to create my first app. And at the same time I was doing this work 
in my internship, I started to think about that idea that I had about a resource where people could easily find books where the main characters were of color and the authors were of color. So I started collecting these type of books in a Word document. I got to about 300 books and I said, okay, I think I'm ready to create this into an app. So at the time I used Parse, RIP, <laughs> and I put all of those books from the Word document into Parse and I created the first version of ReRead 2. So the first version of ReRead 2 launched on August 24th, 2014. When I launched the first version of the app, it was really simple. It was pretty much a table view that had a list of these books, a detail view that showed you a bit of information about the book and the cover, and then a suggestions page that allowed me to kind of crowdsource more books that should be added to the directory from users. And I was super excited to release this. I really didn't think anybody would use it, to be honest. I thought maybe one or two people would use it and maybe it would have some impact in a couple of people's lives. As you can see here, I was super excited. I modeled the app icon after my niece, who at the time was four, and she has the little puffs on the side of her head, and we made t-shirts, and I was so excited to, to launch this first version of the app. Not only for me, but for kids like my niece and kids all over, because I feel like it's really important for all kids to be exposed to diverse stories. So as time went by, Riri 2 actually made a ton of impact. I've heard from librarians, educators, teachers, parents, folks who have loved being able to have an easy resource that allows them to find books for the youth in their community to expose them to not only stories where they're represented, but expose them to stories that are different from themselves. Because Riri 2 is not only just for kids of color, but it's for all types of kids. Because I think it's important for kids especially to be exposed to diverse stories and cultures different from themselves so that they can celebrate and understand difference. And so when they get older, they don't hate difference or they're not afraid of difference. So in 2015, something really incredible happened to me. <laughs> I, was, I had the privilege and honor of being honored by the First Lady Michelle Obama. Now, how this actually came to be, I, in my second year of college, during my a winter term, I got an email from someone from BET and they were talking about the Black Girls Rock Award, which is an annual award show they have to celebrate and highlight black women all over the country doing amazing things. And they said, we have a Making a Difference Girl Award, and you're up for being a candidate for that award because this year we're focusing on education. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so honored. This is great. And so we kept in communication and at the time, it was a really pivotal time for me. I was taking two of the hardest CS classes at the same time. I was taking CS50, which was software development and design, where we were using C to create a search engine from scratch. Yeah, <laughs> it was really, really hard. And then I was also taking discrete mathematics at the same time. <laughs> so at the time, I was struggling and I was wondering if I was actually cut out to continue being a computer science major. So to have BET reach out to me about this Making a Difference Girl Award really inspired me to keep going and to realize that what I'm doing can have a huge impact and no matter how hard it is or how much I'm struggling, I should really keep going. And so I had no idea that the First Lady was going to be at the award show. It wasn't until the day of the, the award show that I decided to just Google, who's gonna be there tonight? <laughs> because I know usually there's like some celebrities and things, and so I was just curious. And so I Googled and I saw that it said, First Lady Michelle Obama attending Black Girls Rock to, uh, to honor the Mad Girl Award recipients. And I kind of like dropped my phone because <laughs> I realized that was me. I was one of those recipients. And so it was an incredible experience to hear the First Lady talk about her own struggles in education and the experiences that she went through. 
and really just, it resonated with me so much. And she talked about the importance of education and it inspired us to keep going. And she was so sweet. Afterwards, she you know, gave us hugs and she asked us how we were doing. And it was one of, honestly, the most impactful moments of my life. And it also really accelerated the rest of my career and especially Riri too. So after that, in 2017, I did an Indiegogo campaign for Riri too. This was really, really scary for me, but it got to the point where I realized that I needed some help if I wanted to make sure that Riri 2's reach can continue to expand. I was working on it solo. I was a college student. I really didn't have a lot of money but I knew I wanted to do an Android version of the app, and I wanted to hire a designer to make it look better. So I talked to friends, and they suggested that I do a crowdfunding campaign. Now, anyone who has done crowdfunding probably knows how scary it is to just release something and ask the community for money. I really didn't know how people were going to react to it. But luckily, I was able to raise over $15,000 which was so helpful because I was able to hire that designer to, to do a complete remake of Riri 2, to make it a better user experience and to make it a richer user experience. I was also able to work with another woman of color who does Android development and hire her and make sure that she's paid equitably to create the Android version of Riri 2. And this was important to me because even though I'm an iOS developer, I understand that the privilege it is to have an Apple device, and everyone around the world especially can't afford to have um, Apple hardware. And so I wanted to make sure that there was an Android version so that Riri 2 wasn't an exclusive resource. It was a resource that everyone could use no matter what their device was. In February 2018, I got featured in the App Store. And as for many iOS developers, this is kind of like a dream come true. I never thought that I would have a feature in the App Store, um, especially for Riri, an app like Riri2. Riri2 is a very niche app, but it's super important to me. And so I was so honored by Apple to be able to be featured in this way. And after that, obviously, any feature in the App Store gets you a lot of eyes. So after I was featured in the App Store, uh, we read to kind of doubled um, in download and users, and we actually crossed the, the bridge of 100,000 downloads. So I was really, really proud and honored to have that accomplishment. So in terms of the future of we read to, it's something that I've been working on for five years, which is a long time, but it's an important resource, I feel, and I want to continue to work on it to make it better. So the number one thing is continue to grow the directory. So when I first launched Riri 2, it was about 300 books. Now it's about over 800 books. And a lot of this is because I have the suggestion feature in the app where users are able to suggest books that should be added to the directory. And that's been super helpful because I can't source all of these books myself. And so I want to grow the directory to over 1,000 books. Because as you saw, there are these books are out there. But the issue is a lot of times they're not being featured on the Amazon bestseller page or Barnes and Nobles, or they're not being displayed in the library. So you have to do some digging really to find them. Of course, as a lot of developers want, I want to make more engaging features for the users. Um, I will, I've been playing around a lot with Swift UI this summer, and I'm hoping to really launch a new version with some more engaging user features whether it's you know, in the fall or, or next year, depending on how Swift UI turns out. <laughs> and then, really, it would be great to partner with organizations. Because Riri2 is, is an app, it's a resource, but there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are focusing on increasing diversity in literature. And it would be great to figure out ways to partner with them and to expand the reach of Riri2, but also making, making sure that it's a technology resource that is kind of complementing the work that a lot of these nonprofits are doing. And on that same vein, Riri2 uh, is increasing the discovery of books by people of color, but it's not solving the real issue at hand. In reality, an app is not going to save the world. 
And the reason why I thought it was important to say this is because a lot of times you hear tech companies really talking about how much they're doing to save the world. And it's really a savior complex that I don't think is really healthy for the industry. Because technology is a tool. It's not solving the systemic issues at hand. For example, the real issue when it comes to diversity in literature is that a lot of authors of color don't have the network to be able to get their book published. Or when they try to get their book published, they get shut down. A lot of authors of color self-publish, but they're not able to market their books well. Right? And these are systemic issues in the publishing industry and the literature industry that an app is not going to solve. So as much as you know, we think about our technology, realize that these are not complete solutions. And we have to, as engineers, make sure that we're engaging with the community that is really trying to solve the systemic issues at hand. So in thinking about my story and journey, I really want to turn it to all of you, thinking about how you can create meaningful tools that has positive impact. It's really about thinking outside of yourself. One way to do this is engaging in your local community and asking the people in your community how they experience and engage with technology tools. A lot of times as engineers, we tend to surround ourselves with other engineers. When we're talking about our ideas and our products, we ask other engineers. But if you engage with your local community and local businesses, you'll be surprised at how people really don't understand technology and they're not using it in their local businesses or in their local community resources. So if you get out and go to your local businesses and just have conversations with them, there might be some type of simple tool that can go a long way and help them make their business more efficient or help their local resource and reach more people in the community. And it may seem something simple for us to do, but to them it might have a huge impact. And I think that's what's important. A lot of times we want our apps and our products to reach millions of people, which is great, but you can also impact a couple of hundred people or even 10 people, and that can make a huge difference in those people's lives. And so it's important to engage with the folks around you in the communities that you live in and see if you can help them make their experience with technology better. If you're building something, making sure that you test it with folks who experience life differently from yourself. So this is really more about the accessibility aspect, right? I remember when I first started getting into engineering and I was making things, I was testing it myself. And I'm like, oh, this works, great, good, let's ship it. It wasn't until I got reached out to by an Apple engineer on the accessibility team who said, hey, have you thought about accessibility? I really love Ruby too. But there are some accessibility problems with the app. And I, I didn't know what accessibility was. And so I got on a video chat with him, and he walked me through voiceover. And he said, listen, there are people who are blind who want to use your app. There are people who experience life differently and are differently able who use different kind of technology tools to interact with technology. But in order for you to make sure that they can use your app, you have to think about these things in your development. I actually ended up doing an internship with the Apple accessibility team, which blew my mind and really reshaped of how I think about engineering. My project was trying to make Xcode more accessible for blind programmers. And that's something that I had never thought about before. How do you interact with Xcode? How do you make an app when you can't see Xcode? And so working on that project just reshaped of how I thought about engineering and how I thought about accessibility. And so it's so important that if you're building something, when you're user testing, you think about people who are different from you and making sure that those people get, get a chance to see how they experience it so you can make those improvements before you launch the product. And there's a great accessibility talk that you should check out later by August. And so definitely check that out and making sure that you're thinking about accessibility in your product. So think about the times where you or someone you know has struggled to find access to something. That's really the heart of Reread too, right? It was, I struggled to find access to these type of books, and I knew other kids did as well. And when it came to looking around in my community, thinking about my niece, 
I know that this was a, a, a problem, an access problem. So think about things that you struggle to access or were you researching something and you had to find like 10 million different blog posts to actually put it together and figure out what it was, right? That's an experience where maybe something consolidated might be useful, creating some type of consolidated resource. I wanted to shout out some really meaningful apps that inspire me. One is by Alicia, which is the Pivo app. This is a national app for domestic violence. And it's for folks who are experiencing domestic violence to have education around what domestic violence is, ways to see local shelters and resources, and think about how they can escape from the situation they're in. And this is just an example of someone who saw domestic people in their family and friends experiencing domestic violence, and she decided to learn ad development to create some type of resource. And she learned ad development in her 50s, right? It's never too late to create these type of meaningful resources. And she's a huge inspiration to me. Another great example is the Lyra app. And this is an app to, for symbol to speech for children with autism. And Kat is one of the co-founders of this app. And I think it's another great example of something that's a technology tool that's out there and is trying to solve a really impactful problem. So sometimes, as developers, we get burnt out right, with programming all the time, whether it's at work or outside work, and understand that side projects aren't for everyone. So maybe you don't have the time right, to make a whole other side project or build something that's meaningful outside of your full-time job. And that's completely reasonable. That's where I think it's important to think about extending the knowledge that you have beyond yourself. So mentoring. Mentoring other people so that more people have the opportunity to create meaningful software. Volunteering with organizations that need technical instructors. There's so many nonprofits out there that are trying to teach technology to people in underserved communities to use, and they need more people who have the technology skills that we do. So volunteering your time with these type of organizations can make a huge impact. And maybe you don't have the time to take on a months long internship, I mean mentorship, or volunteering you know, every week is not something that you have the ability to do. You'd be surprised that even spending one hour chatting with someone who's trying to break into tech could have. I've seen plenty of great folks who on Twitter put calls out and say, hey, I'm gonna put, put an hour on my calendar and we'll do a phone call. And any questions you have about getting into tech or what it's like being a full-time developer, I will, I will answer them. And this is a really great thing to do because so many people just don't have the knowledge of what it's like being in tech or how do you actually break in. So it's just spending a bit of time talking to them and giving them options really can expand what they realize is possible. Mentorship is something that has been in my life and important to me for a long time. So this is way back, I was 14 in, in both of these pictures. And when I was in high school, I co-founded a science camp for girls in my local community. I co-founded it with the Zanta International Org for Women. And we started out by working in our local Boys and Girls Club with a Girl Scouts troop. And our goal was just help them build advanced science projects. So over my time in high school, we put on seven camps. We put on a camp in the summer for five days and in the winter for two days. And we worked with girls age 7 to 12. And we ended up reaching over 150 girls throughout my four years in high school. And this was an uh, experience that really kind of segmented to me that mentorship is so important. And when you know something, expanding that knowledge to others can have a huge impact on what other people see as possibilities for themselves and for their lives. So working with these young girls, you know, I was a, a, a STEM student. I was in the National Honor Society. And working with these young girls, they looked up to me and thought, wow, OK, I can do science. I can, I can be an honor student in STEM as well. And they saw that they were actually able to accomplish advanced things. We actually built crystal radios from scratch with cardboard and copper wire. We got the wire, wired it up, and we took the sound and we put it outside the window and actually caught sound waves. And, their mind was blown. We built rockets from scratch. 
And they were actually able to see that science was cool and science was fun. And this was really a great experience that just opened up my mind to the importance of mentorship. When I actually started my tech journey five years ago, from the start, I got involved with Black Girls Code. After seeing Kimberly Bryant's TED Talk, I knew Black Girls Code was an organization that I wanted to be involved with. So I started mentoring with them, doing you know, workshops that they would do and being a technical mentor. And then in the summer of 2014, I flew down to New Orleans where they were putting on their first hackathon. And the purpose of this hackathon was to, for the girls to come up with ideas about how they can use technology to teach young people about healthy relationships. So as you can see, I'm here with my team, we're kind of prototyping ideas, and I was just there as a resource for them if they had any questions. We used like PhoneGap at the time to come up with a prototype um, by using HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And the girls actually won the hackathon. And they were each able to win $1,500 scholarships for their college education. And one of the girls here, Maisha, she actually just graduated with her computer science degree from a university in Florida. And so it's just so impactful to be able to realize you can inspire people and you never know where their journey might go. And spending a couple of hours, right? We only spent a couple of hours for two days together. And that experience, I still stay in touch with them. And that experience has been able to expand their trajectory of getting into technology. So in thinking about everything that we talked about today and I shared with you, some takeaways I really hope you go away with is one, I'm here today because of the people who saw the potential in me and gave me a chance. So if you're in a position to give folks opportunities or to extend your knowledge, please do so because you never realize the impact that person may have. Build technology that has positive impacts through engaging with people outside of the tech community. It can be so easy to stay within your tech bubble, but the people who are using your product so often are not in this tech bubble. So make sure that you're engaging with people outside of tech and figuring out how you can create tools that may better their lives. Lastly, share your knowledge with others so that more people have the opportunity to create technology. Technology shouldn't be something that's exclusive or that only certain people are able to do. Really, everyone should have the opportunity to learn technology if they want to. So us having the knowledge is, I think, our obligation to make sure that others can then learn that knowledge and expand it so that as many people as possible are creating meaningful tools. Thank you.